Thank you. Yeah, I think as Luke mentioned, I think I see a lot of new faces as well, right? Um, but anyway, welcome. This way, I normally stand. Okay, um, this, uh, as Luke mentioned, this is the beginning of the first, in fact, uh, talk of uh, a new series called Origins. And um, I mean, there, there are four talks in this series. And what this series uh, looks at is really the, um, the origin of um, iconic images um, in art history. Right, such as the Buddha image, right, the, the image of Christ, and the nude. Okay, but other than looking at the origin, right, it also traces um, the evolution and the development of um, these images. Okay, and also how contemporary artists uh, interpret or reinterpret right, these images. Okay, so we're going to look at, um, at, at all these aspects right, in uh, this particular series. So today's um, talk is, uh, is focused on the Buddha image. Of course, if you are Buddhist or if you, are, or you have some knowledge of Buddhism, you know, I suppose you know, it makes it easier to understand. But nonetheless, you know, I'll try my best to uh, provide you with some background right? so that you can actually understand you know, the, the art of this uh, particular religion. And in order to do that, we have to, I have to briefly tell you about the life of the Buddha. And um, now the Buddha was born in uh, what is today Nepal in about, I believe, the 6th century uh, BC, okay, or what, or, you know, they, they like to use the, the abbreviation now called BCE, before the common era. Right? And he was born into a princely family, right? He was the son of a local ruler, so that made him a priest. And um, anyway, his father, you know, um, had planned for him to, to be his successor, right? And um, so his father did everything he could Okay, to, for example, um, shield the Buddha from learning about um, you know, um, religion okay, or about the human suffering. Okay, but one day, you know, the Buddha um, sort of went outside the confines of the palace and he came across right, four, um, I would say, uh, types of condition, right, human condition. Okay, the first one is, of course, the sick. And then you have the aged. And then uh, he came ac across the corpse and also a holy man. Okay, so from this uh, particular experience, okay, uh, he has um, decided right, that uh, perhaps he wanted to become an ascetic in order to look for the answer okay, to the human condition or to human suffering. Now this uh, slide, particular slide uh, shows you um, a very famous, um, it's actually a medallion, okay, a medallion that used to be part of what you call a stupa. Now, stupa is actually a Buddhist monument, okay, that housed the, the relics and the remains of the Buddha and his disciples. Okay, and on this medallion, which is about 19 inches in um, diameter, um, it tells the story of Queen Maya's dream. Okay, because the Buddha was uh, conceived miraculously, or what you call the Immaculate Conception. Okay, so the virtuous queen Maya okay, dreamt that uh, a white elephant, okay, which is the Buddha, okay, um, entering her side, okay, as you can see. And while, while she's actually sleeping, okay, and she's attended to by um, two of her attendants okay, at the foot, at, on the side of her bed. And, you'll find also a lamb stand okay, at the foot of the bed. Okay, so this was, a, 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 I suppose, a kind of a mirac miraculous moment okay, when the Buddha, as a white elephant, entered right, the site of you know, um, uh, Queen Maya. It's a very well composed work, if you can see. You know? I mean, there are the, quite a number of figures here, but yet you know, the, it doesn't seem so crowded right, in terms of the composition. And you know the details are there as well, like you know the jewelry on Queen Maya, etc. So to continue the story, um, so the Buddha decided. Now he had, he had a wife. He was married, and I believe he had one, uh, one child. Okay, so but he decided to leave everything behind. Okay, and sought 
life as an ascetic in the forest. Okay, so um, he left the palace in what is known as the Great Departure. Okay, and on the right you see an example of a relief sculpture depicting the Great Departure. Okay, and it seemed that during this time the gods, uh, you know, in fact, marved the hoofs of the horses so that you know the Buddha could can, uh, in fact, leave the palace, you know, um, in in the stealth of the night. Right. So I suppose the the people, you know, you, you see some uh, figures there, you know, lifting up the hoof of the horses, right? That's probably part of that that kind of uh, okay, the the divine help that he received. Okay, and when he went, um, he spent about seven years as an um, uh, ascetic, right, in the forest. I mean, he, he practiced austerities under, I believe, uh, two teachers. Okay, and um, he did ex extremities or austerities like fasting. Okay, so on the left, you see a, quite a realistic depiction of the fasting Buddha from Gandhara. Okay, and um, so, but, okay, um, he found that it... Um, you know, these austerities didn't help him to find the answer or the truth. Okay, so he decided to then um, spend 49 days right, under the Bodhi tree. Now, the, it's called a Bodhi tree. It's actually a, a bow or fig tree. Okay, the Bodhi tree means um, enlightenment. Bow tree means enlightenment. Right? So he spent 49 days under the Bodhi tree. Okay, now this uh, particular relief sculpture from Borobodo, Right, um, shows the great tonsure. Now, the great tonsure um, was the moment when the Buddha shaved off his head to become an ascetic. Right? Okay, but as I mentioned, he, he, he didn't find any solution, so he decided to then meditate under the Bodhi tree for 49 days. Oh, I forgot to mention that, you know, the Buddha... The, the word the Buddha is, an, is a title, it's not his name, right? It means the enlightened one. Okay? His, uh, his family name is actually uh, uh, Gautama, okay? right? Siddhartha Gautama. Or he's also known by the kind of honorific title Shakyamuni, meaning sage of the Shakyas, because he belonged to the Shakya clan. Okay, so what happened? You know, 49 days, okay, was under the Bodhi tree and, you know, he was assaulted by uh, the evil one, Mara. Okay, but, uh, you know, those temptations and, and attacks, right, didn't succeed. Okay, and finally, he achieved uh, what we call uh, uh, enlightenment, okay, after 49 days. Okay. And, um, and upon enlightenment, you know, he, he, he had found a solution to life's problems and sufferings. Okay, and this is now enshrined in what you call the Four Noble Truths. Right? That, um, the first Noble Truth is that there's suffering. Right? Suffering is caused by desire. Okay, the third Noble Truth is that desire can be overcome. Okay, and the fourth Noble Truth is that desire can be overcome by following the Eightfold Path. Okay, the Eightfold Path is things like right action, right speech, right understanding, etc. Okay, there are eight of these. Okay, and for the next, I think, about 40 to 50 years, the Buddha went, um, you know, uh, proceeded to, to, to preach, okay, this uh, doctrine, okay, and he also began to form uh, a monastic community, okay, and finally, of course, he had to die like all humans, right, and, you know, and that's, that's what you call the great release, okay, Pari Nirvana, the great release, okay, where he died, and he entered into Nirvana, right, now, don't confuse this term Nirvana and Enlightenment, Okay. Now, the nirvana is when um, you actually, um, you know, it's an extinction or release from um, earthly existence. Okay, you'll, you'll not be reborn. Okay, there won't be any uh, sort of, uh, you know, cycle of birth and rebirth. Right, it's an extinction of uh, desire. Okay, a release from uh, suffering and earthly existence. Okay, that's the term uh, nirvana. Now, in, okay, and, you know, the, the Buddha, you know, did, he didn't sort of um, claim to, you know, to found a religion, okay, and he didn't claim to be a god, right? And in fact, his uh, early followers um, regarded him as, as an earthly teacher, as a human teacher, right? So in early Buddhism, um, the Buddha is represented um, not figuratively, but through symbols, okay? And another reason is that through symbols, uh, 
perhaps because he had also achieved enlightenment. Right? So, you know, you, 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 the, the, the human uh, body is now, you know, it's gone, it's extinct. Right? In, it was only later on, I'll talk about that, that, you know, um, you know uh, when, when there are um, other doctrines that, you know, um, change Buddhism, that, you know, the, the Buddha image, in fact, appeared. Now, from uh, India, um, Buddhism began to spread, okay, um, either through uh, missionaries or along the Silk Road, you know, through traders, okay, for example. Right? And I believe it first went to Central Asia. Okay? Central Asia is you know, along the, the Silk Road. Okay? And uh, later on, it went to, to China, and then um, later on to Korea and Japan. Okay? And then um, later on, about the third century, um, AD, right, it went to, um, it was transmitted to Southeast Asia. Okay, and, you know, and wherever it went, okay, um, the local artisans or, or craftsmen, sculptors, you know, adapted the Buddha image to the local conditions. Okay, so, you know, if you look at, for example, a Chinese Buddha, right, or a Cambodian Buddha, you'll see that the face of the Buddha, even the drapery, Okay, are uh, different, right? And uh, this particular, um, this in fact is a famous um, um, uh, colossal Buddha. Now, the, this colossal Buddha started to appear again due to the influence of Mahayana Buddhism, okay? Which again saw the Buddha as a kind of a super mundane, superhuman figure, okay? So hence, you know, the Buddha uh, has to take on a kind of a, 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 a you know, a massive scale, a colossal scale. Okay, and um, this particular uh, Buddha can be found in the famous uh, Yungkang, right, caves in China, right? And uh, it was, uh, in fact, uh, sculpted during the Northern Wei uh, dynasty. Okay. And the Northern Wei rulers were themselves uh, not really Chinese. I believe they also came from Central Asia, right? And, um, you know, and, and this, this uh, cave, uh, you know, the, the grottoes, right, okay, would, would, um, would contain, for example, the, uh, the cells for the monks and also, um, you know, there are also uh, paintings and, and sculptures. Okay, so here you see uh, the colossal Buddha done in a very, um, I would say, a hybrid style, right, not an entirely Chinese style, okay, a hybrid, okay, uh, Central Asian, okay, you have a bit of Indian style as well, okay, and in fact, the feature is also very much, uh, um, you know, uh, Chinese rather than Indian. Okay. So here you see the Buddha um, uh, seated right on the coils of the of the serpent. Okay, they are altogether three coils, and he said that these three coils again represent, okay, the, the the so called three jewels of Buddhism. I mean the the Buddha, the law, and the Sangha. Okay, the monastic community. And this is a very arresting and a very unique figure. Okay? The figure of the walking Buddha. Okay, and it's said to be, um, I mean, you can find a, very, a few, few examples elsewhere, right? But it's, a, it's in fact a Thai invention. Right? You don't find this, for example, in India. Okay? So, in fact, the Thai, you know, with the walking Buddha, the Thai, um, uh, Thai Buddhism, in fact, completes all the, the poses of the Buddha, you know, you have um, you know, the, the sleeping Buddha, right, the walking Buddha, the seated Buddha, right, and you know, it's a very elegant and graceful image, I mean, it reminds one of, of the dance, you know, right, the kind of classical dance, okay, right, but, um, you know, and not only that, but if, you know, if you see that, you know, the, the figure here is, um, is walking rather, or striding rather confidently, okay, confident in the resolute law, Right, that um, you know he has uh, managed to, to preach, right? Um, and you know here again we find if you look at the right hand, okay, it's, it's kind of hanging down loosely, okay, like um, the trunk of an elephant, right? And its uh, fingers as well, okay. In fact, um, um, it's bent backwards, right, like the like the the petals of a lotus opening. Right, and his left hand makes the gesture of uh, Apaya Mudra, or gesture of fearlessness. Okay, and one distinctive feature you'll find on Thai Buddhas is this uh, flame-like 
Ushnisha, right? Yes, this flame like Ushnisha. Okay, and really Buddhism or Buddhist, Buddhist art rather reached its peak in Thailand during the Sokotai okay, um, dynasty. Okay, so this is an example of a Sokotai uh, Buddha. All right, uh, as you can see, very uh, smoothly uh, modeled right, figure. Now, this is an example of uh, what you call the, um, the reclining or the sleeping Buddha. Okay. Um, this is um, you know, known also by the term called par Parinirvana. Okay, it depicts the Buddha okay, um, when he was approaching death. Right? And this is a, this is a very uh, uh, famous example from the Wat Pho temple in Thailand. Okay? And it measures about 150 feet right, in length. Okay, and its uh, food itself is made of uh, mother, of, mother of pearl, right? And if you look at this Buddha, um, you know, the reclining Buddha is uh, meant again to, to, to um, you know, to signify his death and his attainment of nirvana. Okay, hence uh, he's always shown in a very uh, sort of composed, tranquil state. Okay, um, in a in a sense, in complete detachment from the world. Okay, so that's the state you achieve when you actually reach Nirvana. Okay, for the rest of the time, I'm going to focus on, you know, contemporary, um, so-called, well, if there's such a term, contemporary Buddhist art. Okay, or at least contemporary art that, you know, um, is influenced by the Buddha image or by Buddhism. Okay. And I'm going to focus uh, mainly uh, on, on Asia, right? And you know, in Asia itself, um, many artists continue to draw from their own tradition, okay, from their own heritage and their, their culture. Okay? And Buddhism remains a, a great source of inspiration. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that you know, um, anyone who, who, who um, draws from a Buddhist theme is actually religious or pious. Okay? But I would say that you know, these artists, in fact, uh, appropriate Okay, the, the Buddha image um, as a critique, a commentary okay, of, on, on what's happening around them, on contemporary politics, okay, on uh, social issues, on rampant consumerism, okay, and on uh, you know, a kind of capitalist exploitation, and even globalization, okay, or global homogenization. Right? Okay, I'm going to show you some examples. Um, this particular work, okay, it's a painting by Pratwang. Okay, uh, now Pratwang was a, a Thai artist, okay, who emerged in the 1970s. Okay, he was the founder of the Dhammas group. Okay, now the Dhamma group of uh, Thai artists uh, sought to synthesize um, Buddhism with abstract art. Okay? But some of them also used art Okay, as a form of social political commentary on what's happening in Thailand, okay, on Thai politics. Okay. Now, in 1976, uh, this group decided to hold their third exhibition. Right. And um, one day after the exhibition opening, okay, a riot took place. Okay, some university students, uh, in fact, rioted. And the police came in and, you know, it led to it led to deaths, right? People dying. Okay, and I think maybe a few days after that, right, the exhibition itself was shut down. Okay, it was ordered to be shut down. Okay. And um, in fact, this was not the first time that the riot happened, right? Uh, the first one actually happened in 1973, when also the same group of university students rioted. Okay, and also there were violence and all that resulting in, in deaths. And really, I mean, when you want to uh, look at um, the emergence of uh, you know uh, activism in Thai art. Okay, Nine, the early seventies was a period. Okay, when all this uh, sort of political turmoil, right? Uh, in fact, turned uh, Thai artists right into activists. Okay, and they use art, okay, as a form of social, social political commentary. Okay, now this uh, this work is uh, very surreal, as you can see. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, 
is entitled uh, Red Morning Glory and Rotten Gun. It reminds one of like, uh, you know, one of Dali's work, right? The persistence of memory. Okay, where you also have this uh, very bleak, desolate landscape. Okay. And then uh, you have these mysterious beams of light, okay, that, you know, makes uh, the desolation even more stark. Okay, and you know, the, the light itself reveals, for example, uh, I don't know, what looks like fallen trees, and then in the background, you'll, you'll see also skulls, right? Okay, skulls. So, this, in this whole painting, right, um, you know, you have uh, death all around. Okay, and then on the right, you see a Buddha image, but with the head having, having fallen off. Okay, so I think that's a very uh, powerful statement. Okay, that, you know, in the midst of this violence, you know, um, you know, perhaps religion was, you know, even not spared, right? Okay, so that's a very, I would say, a, quite a powerful work, right, in terms of uh, um, making a, a statement, okay, um, on what was happening in Thailand at that time. Now, this uh, mural can be found not in Thailand, Okay, but in a Wat, W-A-T, Wat is a, is a temple, right? Okay, uh, in Wimbledon, UK. Right. In fact, it's the first uh, ever Thai temple in, uh, in Europe. And I think it remains one of the few Thai temples okay, uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, I think what's uh, interesting about this, uh, what, what makes it so... Um, um, famous, okay, attracting uh, you know tourists, uh, you know, uh, into its premises is are, are the murals, okay, the murals that you find in the ordination hall, okay, of the temple, okay, and um, these uh, murals were done under the the guidance of two teachers, and they got their students to help them, right, starting about the nine the early nineteen eighties. Now. I mean, of course, um, you know, in order to do this mural, they, um, I mean, murals can be found, of course, quite widely in Thailand, in Thai temples. Okay, so of course, the, the source of inspiration are the traditional Thai murals. But if you look at it, at these murals uh, carefully, you okay, you can see why they are so controversial. Okay, because um, yes, he does, uh, I mean, the murals do uh, talk about Buddhism, Okay, some of the, uh, the key events in Buddhism. Okay, but he actually used, or, or rather the artist actually used uh, you know, figures and objects from contemporary society. So, um, now this particular, and you can see that is, the colors are very vivid and very brilliant. Okay, because here they actually, the artist actually used uh, spray paint okay, and uh, acrylic rather than the traditional tempera okay, uh, that were that was traditionally used for, for painting uh, murals. Okay. And uh, this uh, particular mural uh, depicts the episode of, uh, which I showed you earlier, right? Um, the attack of Mara. Okay. But here it, it looks uh, like World War Three happening. Eh? Okay. You see uh, Mara, you know, and his host, his minions. Um, they're actually carrying different types of weapons. You know, uh, rocket launchers, machine guns. Okay, um, and and it, on the right you even have a kind of a, a missile, right? Okay, but on the left you see the Buddha there meditating. You know, right, undisturbed by all this. Of course, you know Mara attacked him and wanted to distract him from his uh, from achieving enlightenment. Okay, but yet the Buddha remains uh, unfazed. Okay, he's he's calm. Okay, of course he has his own celestial. Uh, host protecting him. Okay. So you can see how contemporary artists, you know, in fact, draws from tradition, okay, but yet, you know, interpreting it, okay, in very contemporary ways. Uh, this uh, are two works by Gongka um, Jiatso, okay, who is a leading Tibetan contemporary artist. Okay, in fact, he was the one who uh, introduced, um, you know, um, um, contemporary Tibetan art to the outside world, right? And uh, the, the one on the left was uh, shown quite recently, 
Okay, at a show in the Singapore Museum. You have, you have seen it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Some of you have seen it. Okay. It's uh, it's called a collector show, right? And uh, this particular um, uh, Buddha was uh, displayed there. Okay. And uh, if you look at it, it's, it's, it's a Buddha. It's a Buddha figure. Okay. But uh, what is so unusual is that it is actually plastered with layers upon layers of stickers. Okay. So the artists has, have actually turned the Buddha from a religious icon to a pop icon, right? And, you know, I mean, um, Jasso's work frequently deals with things like identity politics and also um, the effects of globalization, okay? So we can see here, you know, how perhaps um, the effects of globalization, mass media, popular culture, right, um, had affected um, uh, Buddhism and in fact turn um, popular culture into a kind of religious icon instead. Right? And on the right is a quite, quite a similar work, but instead he actually uses uh, gridded pencil lines right, to depict the Buddha. And it's also filled with stickers, but those stickers are actually um, from one particular character, the Pokemon. You know the Pokemon, the popular uh, Japanese anime. Right? Um, yes, that's why it's called the Pokemon Buddha. Okay, so you see, um, you know, artists like like uh, uh, like Jasso, you know, very much, uh, you know, um, also, I mean, you may find that these works are perhaps a bit irreverent, okay, um, you know, or, or sacrilegious, but you know, actually, it's not true because some of these artists are actually, uh, you know, they are they are they are practicing Buddhists, and um, you know, they they. They use the Buddha, in fact, as uh, the Buddha image as a, as a catalyst, okay, to talk about certain social and political issues. Uh, his, okay, Jasso is now based, you know, he's actually uh, based, he's shuttling between Beijing, London, New York, but this particular artist, uh, Gede, right, or Gede, he actually lived, he's based in uh, Tibet, okay, um, but uh, his works also, um, you know, um, talks about the effects of uh, globalization, okay, on, on religion. Okay, so in this series, it's called um, Five New Buddhas, okay? But you only see, you can only recognize the, you know, at the center one, right, the, 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 the Buddha image, okay? But whereas the others are replaced by um, popular, okay, characters from popular culture like Batman and Spider-Man, Mickey Mouse, okay? Because, you know, and as uh, Gede himself said, you know, if you go to Tibet today, you know, we think of Tibet as a very mysterious, exotic place. But actually it's not. Okay, there's, uh, you know, there are fast food chains, rock music, okay, nightclubs, right? Okay, and, and, and all that you, you'll find in Tibet. Right? And he also recounted uh, one time when he went to a village, a, a remote village in the Himalayas. And he found that children there carry school bags with Mickey Mouse, you know, sort of images and drinking Coca-Cola and all that. Okay. And talking about irreverence, you know, I mean, he, you know, he has come in defense and he said that you know, the responsibility of the artist goes beyond creating beautiful things. I just say what I believe. Okay. And he said the Buddhist gods would understand right? okay, what, he, what he's doing. Mm. Okay, this is a work by Kalidas uh, Jaraman. In fact, Kalidas is just sitting behind. Kalidas? <laughs> okay, he's the artist. Eh? In, in fact, Kalidas was, uh, I actually requested an image from him to show, you know. He's uh, one of my former students from La Salle, right? I think more than 10 years ago, in fact, he graduated. And Kalidas is now uh, teaching um, in, a, in a secondary school. He's an art teacher, right? And, you know, the, the Buddha image, uh, you know, in fact, has formed an integral part of his artistic practice. Um, in, in this particular work, right, you see that the, the, the head of the Buddha, in fact, uh, dominates the, the whole canvas. Okay, and um, he uses uh, a particular technique where you know, he actually um, paints on linen. Okay? And uh, the effect that you see there, right, the kind of uh, worn out effect, okay, is achieved by painting on the, on the linen or the fabric and then you know, ripping it off. Right? Okay, so that's, you know, and the, the Buddha head appears to sort of emerge from the background, you know, I mean, it appears that way, you can look at it that way, 
Okay. Now in the foreground, you have um, a monk, a novice monk. Right? And the novice monk there is, uh, uh, is, is studying the scripture. Okay. And um, you know, again, I was told that you know, there's a kind of underlying message right, in, in, this, uh, in this picture. Okay, which is, uh, you, know, um, you know, especially in, in the, the society in which we live in, I mean, um, pointing out specifically to Singapore, right, where, you know, the uh, education system is so um, stressful, you know, where everyone competes to getting the top grade, okay, which they think is an avenue to getting the best job, right? And as a result, you know, teachers are stressed and all that, including Kalidas, right? Okay. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, but... So this, uh, this image of the, of, the, of the boy, the boy monk studying the scripture is that, you know, in, in pursuit of all this, uh, you know, um, to get the best grades, okay, we have probably lost um, sight of the true knowledge, okay, whatever that true knowledge might be. In this case, right, is a kind of spiritual knowledge, okay? The true knowledge might be more important things than just getting good grades, for example, right? So I suppose this work you know, speaks of, of a, you know, a kind of a deeper sort of uh, meaning or message. Now this work, if you have gone to the ACM, Rachel, you know this work, I believe. Okay? You've probably guided it. You know. um, yes, it's, it's in fact acquired by the Asian Civilizations Museum, although it's a contemporary work. Right? And it's by this Thai artist called Jakai, and I think uh, I'm not sure. Okay, I was sent an email. Okay, uh, that Jaka is going to have a solo show here, right? It's going to be held at Yavu's Gallery in Waterloo Street, right? and um, so now Jaka is one of the leading uh, Southeast Asian artists working with textile. Okay, working with textile, and here you know, um, you know, you see this uh, work. It's an installation work, right? Um, and it comprises, uh, you know. Uh, multitudes of uh, uh, Buddhas okay, um, in the sitting position right? and, and the Buddhas themselves are made out of uh, hemp, H-E-M-P Hemp I think is from the cannabis plant right? okay, but it's made into a kind of uh, industrial material okay? and um, the, the threads themselves are also made of hemp okay? so as a whole right, it forms a pyramid okay? and actually it's not a pyramid, it actually refers to a stupa okay, a Buddhist stupa now the, the stupa itself you know the, the shape of the stupa, in fact, was transformed as it went to different countries. Okay, so for example, in Thailand, okay, the stupa, you know, becomes a very, you know, uh, shaped like a bell, right? Okay, and, um, but, you know, what is he trying to say here? What, is there an underlying sort of uh, message, you know? Now, if this is a stupa, right, I mean, it allows us, in fact, to look at the inside, okay, which normal stupas don't normally let us do. Okay. So by doing that, I think the artist is trying to um, ask us to rethink, okay, perhaps about the role of Buddhism today in today's contemporary society. Right? Okay. What does the stupa mean today? Or what does it mean to certain people? All right. okay. Right now, this is a, a, a photograph. In fact, right, it's a photograph of uh, uh, done by a contemporary uh, Chinese artist, okay, Wang Qingsong, right? And now, this uh, you know, work was done in 1999, right? It was, I think, um, the year, right, the period when the Chinese economy was, you know, um, really picking up, okay, and when uh, you know. Um, a kind of symbols of uh, consumerism, okay, were, were sort of, um, you know, um, entering China. Okay, so you see this um, artist, you know, it's, a, it's like a, a self-portrait, okay, um, seated not on a lotus throne or a lion throne, he's seated on a Coca-Cola throne. And um, he has multiple arms. Now, this is not exactly, you know, uh, um, he, he takes on the role of not the Buddha, but the Bodhisattva. Avalokiteshvara, okay, he was normally depicted with multiple arms. Okay. And uh, in his arms, or in his hands, you'll find that he carries, uh, you know, various uh, consumer products, okay, um, you know, uh, handphones and uh, what else? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, and 
And, and in, his, uh, in his other hand, he carries a bottle of Nanjing beer, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, so instead of, I suppose here he's trying to, you know, um, in fact, comment on, on, on um, the state of society, okay, in, uh, in that, um, you know, that in fact we care more for these consumer products than we care, for example, for the poor or the suffering. Okay, so that could perhaps be the kind of message that, you know, he wants to convey. All right, through this uh, through this work. 